Alright, hello everybody. In this video we want to look at the Monty Hall problem. Hopefully made easy. So, why does this problem become tricky? Um, well, I think it's because there are a lot of variables and they're temporally sequenced. So, setting up the correct equations that will give you a meaningful answer is really hard. And it can also be hard through this process to keep track of what is important. Okay, so we have to consider where the car is in reality, which is a random variable that I'll call c. We can take on values 1, 2, or 3. We have to consider our selection of the door. S, we could select 1, 2, or 3. The door that the host reveals, which we'll call h, and that can be 1, 2, or 3, but as we know, it's going to depend on what's already happened. Um, and then we also have to consider whether or not we're going to switch. So there's all of this different stuff going on. Okay, so I've spent a lot of time working on this and I've taken a lot of incorrect paths so I can warn you in advance to not get bogged down thinking about certain things. Okay, for one thing, um, you don't want to be thinking that the particular instantiation of C, S, and H matter. Um, it can just become sort of mind-bogglingly complicated to be considering all, all of the different possibilities simultaneously. So, in my argument, I'll show that this is not affected my argument is not affected by the particular choices, but only by how they condition relative to one another. Okay, secondly, don't try to incorporate the switching variable, like whether or not you switch doors, into the equations. So the argument I'm going to make is based on comparing the prior probability that the car is behind each door to the posterior probability that the car is behind each door. And whether or not you switch, um, is basically an afterthought when you consider and compare those two probabilities. Okay, to rephrase that, to switch or to stay does not enter into the equations explicitly. So forget about it for now. Okay, rather comparing the posterior distribution of C with the prior distribution of C where the car is implies which door has the highest probability in light of our new evidence. Okay, so before proceeding, there's a few things that you have to know. You have to like know Bayes' theorem, um, which if you know Bayes' theorem and you like see how it's constructed, this means that you've got to understand conditional probability and also the law of total probability. So I have a video where I actually pr um, more, I, th I think I prove both of these things. So those would be really good things to check out and have in your toolkit before you try to think about this problem. Okay, so let's get started. We want to consider first the prior distribution of C. And so just to just to put it in like sample space um, sort of format here, uh, we can let this be our sample space, and we can let omega 1 be the outcome of the simple event that c is equal to 1. Some people are, are, aren't going to like that, but basically omega 1 is that c equals 1, omega 2 is that c equals 2, and these, these basically partition the sample space and are equal probable. So we can talk about now our events, uh, events, um, so we call it C1, it's that C is equal to 1, and so C2 is that C is equal to 2. Um, okay, anyway, this, like, isn't that important. Um, okay, now consider that I select a door, say I select door 1. And that the host opens a door, say the host opens door number two. So this is like, this is my scenario. 
and I said before that the particular instantiations aren't important and what I'm going to show is that they are not absolutely important because when we get to our end result you'll see that I could have selected anything and the host could have revealed either of the other two doors and it just would have changed um, it, it just would have swapped these two probabilities that we get at the end but the, the choice of whether or not to switch would still be the same um, Okay, so it's extremely important at this point to classify our terms. So C is the random variable we are ultimately interested in. We have to understand that it is not conditional on anything. C just is in our model. Um, However, when we use Bayes' theorem, we are allowed to mentally instantiate it, or like suppose that it takes on certain values for the purposes of evaluating conditional probabilities. Okay? S is basically a parameter of our choosing, so we have to be very careful to not think of S as a random variable. Um, and this, this is kind of like a contentious claim. But what I'm suggesting is that even though when we make a choice of one, two, or three, it feels it feels like it could be a random variable. I'm I'm contending that it's not. Um, it's not because assuming the other two things are random. Like how I'm about to phrase this. Like, just think of S as a parameter of our choosing, okay? And the, the reason that it's convenient to do this is because, well, theoretically, you could go play the Monty Hall problem and always choose the first door, and that shouldn't, that shouldn't, assuming the other two things are random, that shouldn't be to your, to your detriment. It shouldn't matter. Um... And when we start talking about the probability of S and H occurring together, it's much easier to not have to consider the joint distributions of S and H if we can just let S be fixed. Okay, and then thirdly, H is a random variable that is conditioned on both C and S. Okay, so this is just getting straight like what's what. Okay, so next we can write Bayes' theorem. So what we're interested in is the posterior distribution of where the car is, given my selection and the host's choice. So to write Bayes' theorem, um, you know, the probability that the car is behind the first door, you just substitute 1 in for, for n in the numerator and the denominator is this. Okay, so this may look a bit hairy, but there's a few things we want to notice. First, notice that this probability c equals n or c, c equals 1, for instance, um, is going to cancel because, okay, so when we solve this for c equals 1, we're going to have probability of C1 here, and we're going to have probability of C1 in the first term, probability of C2 in the second term, probability of C3, but those are all equal to a third. So this can come out of the summation, and it can cancel here. Okay, so we've taken care of that piece. Um, secondly, we want to see that for for each of the three elements of the posterior distribution, the denominator is the same. Okay, this piece doesn't change. So to simplify the computation, we can just take the numerators and normalize so that they sum to 1. So we're going to just forget about the denominator completely. Um, 
So in other words, in the Bayesian model of the posterior is the likelihood times the prior divided by some constant. We can just get rid of the constant and note the proportionality of the posterior with the prior times the likelihood. In this case, since the likelihoods were all the same, oh sorry, since the, the priors were all the same, um, they can cancel out and this proportionality holds. Okay, so let's go through and solve this then. Uh, the probability that C1, that the car is behind the first door, given that I've selected the first door and that the host has selected the second door, this should be proportional to the probability of my selecting the first door and the host selecting the second door, given that the car is behind door one. Okay, so consider this. Given that the car is behind door one, the host and given that I've, um, knowing that I've selected the first door, the host could reveal either the second or the third door. Okay, so there's two different doors that the host could reveal. So assuming that the host doesn't have a preference for which door they open, that their opening of a door is equally likely, given that there are two to choose from, we can say that this is equal to a half. Okay, consider the next scenario where the car is behind the second door. Given that the car is behind the second door, what is the probability of my selecting the first door and the host opening the second door? Okay, well, if the car is behind the second door, the host cannot open the second door, so this has zero probability. And lastly, we just have to consider when the car is behind the third door, um, what is the probability of the host opening the second door given that I've selected the first? Well, if the car is behind the third door, the host can't open that. And if I've selected the first door, the host can't open that, which means the host has to open the second door, okay? which gives us a probability of 1. Okay, so all we have to do is quote-unquote normalize to 1, which is actually very easy. We just want these, prob these proportional probabilities to sum to 1. So the way you do that is you would just say... one times something plus a half times something plus zero times something has to be one. And so we could just say that three halves Or something is equal to one three x is equal to two x is equal to two thirds. Okay, and then I just back substitute two thirds into into these guys. So the probability of this is equal to two thirds times a half. Here we've got two thirds times one, which is equal to two thirds. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, now we can come in here and complete our posterior distribution. Okay, so we compared the prior and posterior distribution of the location of the car, keep, keeping in mind our original selection. Okay, so if one of the other doors has the higher probability, then it would make sense to switch. Note that if you and the hosts had selected differently, this you can't get away from this implication. You would just be swapping um, what the numbers are, like where which door has which number. So bearing in mind that my choice was one, um, and given what happened with the host reviewing the second door, it's no longer an option to choose. And we can see that the posterior probability that the car is behind door number three is two-thirds versus our one-third. So clearly this implies that we should switch. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you.